Wonderful. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Faithful Census Town Hall and happy Census Day 2020. My name is Kelsey Herbert, and I'm the uh, National Campaigns Director with Faith in Public Life. This is a very exciting day for our nation as we amplify the 2020 census and its impacts over the next 10 years on our nation and on our communities. But we know that it does not come at an easy time. The COVID-19 crisis has consumed our nation and our world and has presented new challenges for all of our communities and no doubt the 2020 census as well. Today, we are gathered as a faith community to hear from national faith leaders and census experts about the importance of the 2020 census, how our faith moves us to be counted and to help our neighbors be counted as well. And also to learn how we can take action in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis to make sure that we have a fair and accurate 2020 census count. Each of our traditions call us to recognize the God-given dignity of every person. We are all made in God's image. It is from this foundation that we speak today and encourage every person to be counted in the 2020 census. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers for this Faithful Census Town Hall. Like I said, these are national faith leaders, census experts, and I'm so grateful for each of you for being here today. I'd first like to recognize Hernusa Fariad, the head of outreach and interfaith at All Dulles Area Muslim Society, otherwise known as the Adams Center. Welcome, Hernusa. I'd also like to welcome Sister Simone Campbell, the executive director of Network, a Catholic social justice lobby. Thank you, Sister Simone, for being here. And Rabbi Jonah Pesner, the director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Welcome, Rabbi. And Reverend Gabriel Salguero, the president and founder of National Latino Evangelical Coalition. We are grateful for you to be here. And Reverend Dr. Leslin Copeland-Toon, the chief operating officer of National Council of Churches USA. Great to see you, Reverend Leslie. And also Adan Chavez, the deputy director of Naleo Educational Fund's census campaign and a partner of Faith and Public Life and a leader in the National Census Counts campaign. Welcome, Adan. And again, my name is Kelsey Herbert with Faith in Public Life, and I'm so glad to be here with you all. For this next hour or so, I'll be asking our speakers a few questions about the census, and I encourage you to do the same. If you're on Zoom, feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat. And if you're on Facebook Live, welcome as well. Go ahead and throw your questions into the chat box, and we'll do our best to get to all your questions. To begin, I will ask Rabbi Pesner to start us off with a word of prayer. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning from the folks on the West Coast, and blessed are you all in being here. Bruchim Habaim. Um, happy Census Day. Um, it's a hard Census Day, and our faith, our communities, our bodies, and our souls are being tested, and so it's more important than ever that we come together, even virtually, um, to celebrate this day of census, of counting, and take a moment to put it in spiritual terms of what's at stake. So in just a few days, the Jewish community will gather in their homes and virtually online together to celebrate the festival of our freedom as we conduct our Passover seders, recounting the story of the Exodus from Egypt. It will be a hard and challenging year to celebrate our Exodus from Egypt because we'll be trapped in our homes and unable to join together with one another in person. But we will be reminded of that story that having known the oppression of slavery, having known the suffering of Egypt, the Israelites were commanded. The first instruction upon their emancipation was to love the stranger, the widow, and the orphan, the most vulnerable. So our sacred purpose here in this day of counting is to make sure that every person, every soul created in God's image is counted so that we can do the things that a society must do, federal funding, elections, counting to make sure that our communities are represented, that resources are allocated, most essentially to make sure that the most vulnerable among us, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger are counted. And it is that once we entered into the wilderness, multiple times God instructed Moses and the children of Israel to count, to take a census. And so we follow in a 5,000 year old tradition of counting and Rashi, the famous medieval commentator once asked the question, why is it that God always instructs us to count? And Rashi's answer, because God loves each and every one of us. So join me in this moment of prayer. God, who liberated our ancestors from slavery in Egypt, 
God who knows the suffering of the most vulnerable, of the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. God who loves each and every one of us, even during these challenging days of COVID-19, of the suffering of our most vulnerable, those who are ill, the healthcare providers who are struggling to take care of them, the spiritual leaders who are helping to make meaning of this terrible moment in history, give us strength to lean into this day of counting to make sure that every one of your children knows that God loves you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Posner, for that, that important reminder and that prayer. So now um, we're going to move into our time of questions. Again, please add your questions to the chat and we'll be sure to get to them. Uh, at first, I'd like to start with Sister Simone. Um, what are the, the values of your faith tradition that call you to be counted in the 2020 census and call you to help your neighbors be counted as well? Well, uh, I wanna echo Rabbi Pesner, so clear, yes, everyone counts. And that's at the heart of our faith. As a, as a Catholic sister, um, our uh, leadership, our popes have said for generations that it is the value of human dignity, the dignity of every individual regardless of what their work, their creation is, needs to be honored, respected, and counted. Right now in our nation, we have kind of a tension between the fight with the economy is more important than the people or are people more important than the economy. Well, in our tradition, it is abundantly clear. It is the people. And this day celebrates the people, all of us together being counted and in our tradition, we call it being one body. We're all together in this. So we have to count every cell of the body so that our body can be whole. Wonderful. And Karin Nusa, I, I would like to ask you the same question next, if you could respond, your tradition, what calls you to be counted? Sure. Um, within the Muslim community and within the Islamic faith, it is important for us to be at one with the community and where we're living and actually help each other out. And if there are resources that are coming from the government and from the state, it is something that we have to partake in. And taking the idea of census in the Islamic tradition, it's not something that's new. Um, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, you know, over 1400 years ago, started the census in Medina with the people who were living there. And then Omar bin Khattab, who was the first First caliph um, added to that where he took survey of the land, he took survey of the people, he took survey of the teachers and how many people were living in Medina, regardless of their faith, um, the survey was taken. And then they, he would take the money from the treasury and allocate that money um, in accordance to what is necessary in the different departments of the categories that they were actually doing the census for. So it's not anything new, but a lot of people don't know this. And this is something that we're spreading out into our community so that people are aware that taking part in the census as Muslims in this country is not something new and there's part of our faith to be um, in, in court you know uh, part of something that is actually benefiting our community the resources that it'll give the representation that will we will have and all of that is part of our faith so I'm you know imploring people to take part in that wonderful and Reverend Salgira how would you respond to that well, first, thank you uh, to Faith in Public Life and all our colleagues from a variety of faith traditions for participating. Uh, my answer is really based on, on, our, on our theology of the Imago Dei, the image of God. Because uh, every person, every human being, man, woman, and child, no matter where they're from, where they were born, what language they speak, was created in the image of God, they have an inherent dignity. And that core value of inherent dignity means they need to be counted. Their voice counts, their person counts. And so this image of God imprinted in every single human being also says that governments, churches, faith traditions should respect the Imago Dei of every person. And part of that respect towards their human dignity is having them counted, being part in this case of in our democracy of all of the resources that their dignity requires and that their dignity includes. I also want to say that part of our tradition is, is remembering what the rabbi said, the protected classes, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the poor, that they're part of the protected classes, and they too shall count, uh, should count. As part of the Latino evangelical community, we are uh, particularly 
interested in that those undercounted and under-resourced communities who also bear the image of God are counted. En otras palabras, todo el mundo cuenta. Todo el mundo cuenta. No importa el lenguaje que ellos hablen, eh, dónde nacieron, la, la religión que practiquen, porque están hechos a la imagen y a la semejanza de Dios. Y por eso estamos aquí. So thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Reverend Salguero. And Reverend Leslie, um, could you share with us what in your faith moves you to be counted and help your neighbors be counted? Thank you. Happy Census Day, everybody. Um, I would say that um, Christian scriptures remind us that each person is important to God, that um, as we just said, we are created in God's image and God knows us and wants to know us. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, God's people are instructed to count those in their families and in their communities. I believe this is not just to have a count, um, but also as a reminder of God's blessings and God's faithfulness. There's this old hymn that we often sing uh, that says, count your blessings one by one. And I would say that from a spiritual perspective, counting those in our community is a reminder and a way of counting God's blessings for us and the blessings that have been bestowed upon us. That each person, every person is important. Each person is a blessing. In addition, in the gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus lets us know that every hair on our head is counted by God. It's just another reminder in my mind of how much God loves us and has made us unique and special. That even as God knows the sparrows, God also knows us and each of us is significant. So while there is no scripture that says thou shalt be counted in the American census, I believe Christian values and scriptures do speak to the importance of us participating and making sure that everyone is counted. We know that everyone being counted has a significant impact on how resources will be distributed to communities. We know that funding for schools, representation in Congress, and so many other important resources for the most vulnerable are determined by the census. And again, that's that protected class, that's the widow, that's the orphan, that's the people who um, are low wage and low uh, income workers. This is why we have a moral obligation and a civic responsibility to make sure every person is counted. That is every single person. And marginalized communities, I think this is particularly important because so often they are um, under-resourced Counting everyone equates to, to taking care of the most vulnerable in our society. Counting everyone means doing justice in my mind and loving mercy. Counting everyone means taking care of and loving our neighbors. And yes, even those who are not so neighborly. So I think that our faith, um, from my faith tradition perspective, that counting everyone is a matter of justice, it's a matter of love which is how justice is lived out in communities. And it's a matter of um, our responsibility. Amen, thank you. It's clear that we're here today because our faith calls us to be, calls us to be counted ourselves, calls us to help our neighbors be counted, um, recognizing the dignity of every person. And that's exactly why we're here today from our various um, faith traditions, but our shared faith values. Um, so I think Reverend Leslie just got to this point, but um, for Anessa, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on um, the census being a snapshot of the country and why is it critical that the census reflects um, our nation accurately? I mean, if we look at the um, structure of just our uh, nation and the compilation of the types of people that are Americans, we can say that we're quite diverse and that that needs to be pointed out. And the people who uh, are from minority backgrounds, people who are under um, uh, counted and who are not represented properly really need to be aware that this is the time to get the resources for you and your community. That, you know, when we look at um, the United States and we look at the different um, backgrounds of people and where everyone came from, not everyone is actually partaking in the census because they have whatever fear or they don't see the importance of it because the information is not there. But what we need to do as a nation is to come together because we are so diverse, because we are 
from different backgrounds. That needs to be represented, and the census is one way to do that. I mean, there are questions about people's background, and not everyone's background is on the census, like mine wasn't, so I had to click on other and then write in my background, which I think that is something that the census needs to take into account and change and add more options in that question. But if I were to just pick white, then it would have just been a certain pool. It wouldn't have actually represented my ethnic background. So I went the other way and clicked the other. And that's what we all need to do is to make sure that we are clicking those answers and writing down what our backgrounds actually are so that we are represented and we are counted. And that the only way to do this is to going through the census and to make sure that our numbers are accurate. And at the same time, the resources that are allocated to us as communities are coming to our communities as well. Fantastic. And Reverend Salguero, from the perspective of the, the immigrant community and the Latino community, why is it important that the, the census represents a fair snapshot, an accurate snapshot of the nation? Well, for one, it's that historically in 2010, a significant number of Hispanics were undercounted, over 2 million Hispanics and, and over 2 million African Americans were not counted in the census. And so those very necessary resources uh, were not arriving to those communities that have historically be, been under-resourced. In, in addition, uh, uh, congressional representation for those communities that are increasingly growing because of a uh, Hispanic population, immigrant population from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, from, from all parts of the world. I think that for us in, in our uh, sacred text and scripture, it tells us that, that we have to remember the immigrant, the, the, what the Bible has called the stranger, because many of us have entertained angels unaware. And, and it's important that all those resources to those communities that have been historically underrepresented get to those communities so they can uh, prosper and so they can flourish. Flourishing is a is a scriptural principle. God wants us to flourish. And part of that flourishing is making sure that those communities that have been historically invisible uh, in the census are no longer invisible. Invisibility is a major concern. And we want to remind everybody that although there were some questions about will there be a citizenship question on the census, there is no citizenship question on the census. And so whether you're a legal resident, a citizen, or an undocumented immigrant. Census 2020, like all census, is counting population. It is not counting who's a citizen and who's not. And, and that myth has to, has to be debunked. Así que, si eres un inmigrante indocumentado, si eres un ciudadano o si eres un residente legal, tú cuentas y hazte contar. No importa quién tú eres, el censo cuenta la población y no importa si eres ciudadano o indocumentado. It's important for us uh, to get that information out so those resources get to our community. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to bring Adan Chavez from the from Naleo Educational Fund into this conversation. Um, Adan, you've been on the ground with uh, communities across the country for the past few months talking about the 2020 census. What are the, the programs that you've um, heard from people on the ground um, that are most important to people that have to do with the 2020 census? Um, where are you hearing the where people's values are? Great, thank you so much, Kelsey. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Like Kelsey mentioned, my name is Adan Chavez and I serve as our deputy director of our national census program at the Naleo Educational Fund. And one thing we have seen that works time after time is sharing with our communities that so many different programs are funded in one way or the other through census derived statistics, right? At Naleo, we conducted research message testing in 2018 and 2019 to really figure out what were some of those messages that resonate with Latinos. And time after time, we saw that when you spoke to Latinos about the importance of census data when it comes to programs for schools, to programs for their communities, that message really resonated with them and they wanted to pivot and participate. And we know that's the case, right? Because there are over 300 programs that in one way or the other depend on census derived statistics. These are education programs, healthcare programs, transportation infrastructure programs, from things like Medicaid, Medicare, SNAP, right? From things like the grants that go to our local education agencies, right? And grants that go into highway planning and construction. 
And right now, given the moment that we are in as a result of COVID-19, this is how our local, state, and federal officials get the resources they need to respond to emergencies like this one. And this is how they also get the data that they need to figure out who is in their community, who needs the resources the most, and where to allocate things like first response services, right? So we know that it's going to be very important to highlight that message. And we see that that message resonates across all kinds of hard to count communities, right? So once we tell people and we make that personal connection, right? If we want our kids to go to good quality schools, if we want our kids to have lunches, right? If we want to have parks and fixed roads, it's important that we get counted so we have that fair share of our pie. That's absolutely the case. And thank you for sharing that, Adan. Um, Sister Simone, Network Lobby is busy um, day after day on the Hill advocating for the issues that faith communities care so deeply about, like poverty and housing and food assistance. Um, it goes on and on the work of Network Lobby. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a bit to the political representation aspect. Not only does census statistics derive um, the distribute the funding for our communities, but also our political representation. How, what does that matter to network and our communities? Well, thank you, Kelsey. This is such a critically important issue that everybody needs to understand is that uh, between 2020 and tw the election in 2022, all of the congressional maps get redrawn to reflect one person, one vote, and to ensure that the changes in population are distributed relatively equally among congressional districts. Now we've been doing a lot of work opposing gerrymandering, which is the dividing of lines in, for congressional districts to achieve some political purpose and going much more towards making sure that the one person, one vote rule in our country reflects who's actually living there. Now, what's interesting in the census, it, it, I mean, in the constitution, it only calls for one person, one vote. It doesn't require that the person be a citizen, that the person be eligible to vote, that the person have actually even registered to vote. If you're in a, if you're in a district, you have a right to be represented by your representative. And so this becomes critically important for the future. Now there's a bunch of fights going on right now in Congress or were going on before they went on, on recess about funding the census because some people are afraid that their state is gonna lose representation. So they thought they shouldn't fund it too much because they don't wanna lose a, a position. It's a very political fight. But others who thought, oh, but my state's gonna get another representative. We need to insist on funding. That's the evidence of how critical this is. This is probably the linchpin for the next 10 years. And some of the fear that both Gabriel and uh, uh, Adan were talking about, I, I want to just add that the census information is not delivered to the administration until the end of the year. And between now and the end of the year, there is a national election where we might be able to make it safer for everybody to respond. So I say, Fear not, step up, be a citizen, be you uh, here just uh, temporarily, whatever you are, we need you counted. You're important. And politics for the next 10 years depend on it. Thank you. Um, speaking on that fear, we know that there is a lot of fear and hesitation because of the proposed citizenship question that won't be on there, but the, the chilling effects of that because of the COVID-19 crisis and distrust in this administration and more. Um, so uh, Reverend Salguero, what is your message to people of faith who are um, in a place of fear and not sure if they should take the 2020 census? Look, I, I think that first of all, we have to recognize that anxiety is real. And, and I think that as, as a pastor, our church has about 5,000 members and our network has about 3,000 churches. And one of the things is we, we recognize that anxiety is real because of COVID-19. And that in the midst of that anxiety, people, people can feel paralyzed. But the most often repeated phrase in scripture, in, in our scripture, is fear not. 
or do not be afraid, some version of that. It's 365 times, one for every day of the year. And so it, we need that kind of courage. That's number one. But at the same time, recognize people's anxiety. Number two is to help people understand that there, there are safe ways to do it. Now we can fill out the census online or by telephone so somebody doesn't have to come to their house. And today's National Census Day, and we're encouraging. I got the letter from the Census Bureau with my number. I immediately went to my laptop and I filled it out. So if you have a cell phone or a laptop or, or access to the internet, and I did it in 10 minutes for, for the four people that live in our house here, here in Orlando, Florida. You can do it, it's safe. It's also, there's a tab for Spanish and Creole and Arabic and, and Mandarin. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a multiple languages and access to it and you can do it from the safety of your own home. Secondly, to be mindful for what, what the census is and what it isn't. Right? It, it's a counting of the US population at a certain moment in time and that that's important and what it contributes to. But so the question is, are we going to, to fear our, uh, feed our fear or are we going to be emboldened to shape our future, to say, hey, the future of this country, the, the kind of pluralistic, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational, uh, multi-faith future of this country, is it going to be represented in the census? And am I going to have the courage, even while you're uh, afraid, and we understand it, that perhaps the best way to, to mitigate that fear is to do something that you can control. And filling out the census is something that you can control. There are things we can't control. And for those things, we pray, we surrender to God, we lean on each other uh, as, as people of faith. But for the things that you can control, those we do uh, with, with faith and with courage and with wisdom. Thank you. And Hernessa, um, what would you, how would you express to people of faith and to the Muslim community? How would you address the fears and uh, share a message of hope in the 2020 census? Okay, so of course, with the Muslim community here in the United States, we always go back to the Muslim ban and all these other um, things that we've been uh, ex uh, that has been imposed on us as a community. But what I try to tell my people um, within my community is that um, within the history of the census, there's never been an, a case where uh, people's confidentiality was violated by the U.S. Census. It is uh, protected under. Title 13 under the US code, so that even if there was something from the Patriot Act or any other um, legislation that would be an issue, this would supersede that and that your inf information would be protected. Um, and of course, um, it hasn't been, there hasn't been a case where that has been violated by the, by the census where our information has been given out. And at the same time, communities who don't take part in filling out the census or don't encourage their communities to fill out are actually um, uh, reaping the repercussions of it not being filled out. For instance, there are communities who need new schools, who need their roads rebuilt, who need hospitals, who need um, just a lot of other resources that they're not getting because they're not filling out the, the census. And so that impacts them not just from an infrastructure point of view, but also economically as well. When you bring these types of uh, or institutions into your communities, you're bringing more jobs. You're bringing more people who you can hire, who can actually take part in rebuilding your community and actually making it more um, you know, affluent and giving more resources to your family and your, especially your children. Um, to think that pediatricians actually look at the census information when they're going about choosing where to open up their um, uh, pediatric offices is a big deal. They look at where there's a huge population of children. And if you're not counting your children, you might not be getting really good quality pediatricians moving into your um, uh, area or opening up their businesses in your area. So the census actually gives a lot of information out to other people who are actually using it in terms of trying to figure out where the best place for their uh, organization or business might be. Within the Muslim community, I also encourage them to fill it out because we need to be counted. Although there is no, you know, religious uh, question on the census, thank God, um, it, it definitely does need to be where we're uh, uh, educating our community the importance of it and, and making sure that um, they're taking part. It, it, taking part in the census and filling it out. And we're there to help them along the way that as people who live in this country, who are part of the fabric of the United States, um, we are educated, we are part of the system. We have people working in many different fields in the government and, and, and all different sorts of um, uh, jobs that are in the United States. We are trying to enforce um, their um, 
education on them, uh, you know, trying to give them that education that they need in order to understand the benefits of the census rather than um, talking about what could happen or what might happen, which has never happened before. So we're only 1% of the US population. You know, it doesn't even like, it's like a drop in a bucket, um, but it's important for us to be counted. And it's, more, it's important for our people to understand that you're part of this country and that you need to reap the benefits that are gonna come your way if you fill out the census. Thank you. Um, it's clear that we are uh, people of hope um, and uh, we are called to uh, fear not, but we also recognize the, the fear and the anxiety. So I hope all of you can take what you're hearing here to share with your communities, to share this message of hope um, and that we are in this together um, and we will move forward together. So thank you all for the, that message. Um, shifting gears a little, um, Adan, the COVID-19 crisis began right as the 2020 census was launched nationally. Um, how is COVID-19 impacting the 2020 census operations and the overall sentiment among communities that you're seeing? We've seen that there is a couple different things happening. I think for one, many people think that the census has been canceled or the census has been postponed, that it's no longer going to take place this year. Now we know that there is a couple of things that have been canceled, but the census definitely was not one of those, right? Second, we also know that as a result, so we have had many different conversations with the Census Bureau, and we know that they are also committed to making sure that they do their part, not to continuously spread the coronavirus, right, or to put at risk their employees or to put at risk the American public, right? So as a result, the Census Bureau is continually monitoring the situation around the coronavirus. That's why this past weekend, it has decided to delay any kind of field operation between now through April 15th. Again, that doesn't mean that the census is canceled, right? That doesn't mean that it's not going to happen and it's not going to happen anymore. But instead, it means that the Bureau is looking and monitoring the situation in real time to then decide, right, what makes the most sense as there is continual developments around the coronavirus, right? So there's a couple things, right, that we still know though. One, people can still very much respond from the convenience of their own home that has not changed. People can still go online. People can get the assistance of a Census Bureau staffer or next, starting next week, people can also receive their paper mailings if they haven't already received one via mail, right? And so, everyone across the country is still encouraged to respond. And now they have up until August 14 to do so, right? One of the things that the Census Bureau did was extend the response period because it acknowledges that there is this pandemic happening and that many communities are impacted by the outbreak of COVID-19. And as a result, it's gone ahead and given us a couple additional weeks to respond, right? This is the perfect activity to do now that folks are social distancing. This is something that we now have more time to do, right? And it's going to be super important that all of us take the time to participate because if we don't participate, between now through May 28th, then we put ourselves, our communities at risk for somebody from the Census Bureau knocking on our door, right? And now in this new period of social distancing, many of us are trying to avoid contact, right? So if folks want to do this, they want to do their civic duty and they want to make sure they're safe and healthy and they're not spreading the coronavirus or any type of virus, right? It's important that they get counted now and they still have an opportunity to do so. Great, um, thank you. So what would you, if you could distill in everything that you said, every, all the amazing information you gave, what's the most important thing for people to know um, in this COVID-19 crisis um, in terms of the census? I would say two main things or three actually, you know, please respond now. It's super critical. For, this data is super critical when it comes to emergencies and public health crises, right? Between, for now in the next 10 years. Two, they have until August 14th to respond, right? And if they don't respond by May 28th, then they might risk somebody coming to knock on their door, right? And of course, we all want to do our part to avoid contact with another person. And then three, right? 
when it comes to the census, right, and everything happening around Census Bureau operations, we still know that next week, if folks do not, if folks do not feel comfortable going online or calling the Census Bureau by phone, then next week they'll start to receive paper forms via mail, right? So if folks have been waiting for that moment and folks feel just more comfortable filling out a physical paper form, then starting April 8th, everyone will have an opportunity. So please respond in whatever way makes the most sense for you. Please respond in whatever way you feel most comfortable with, but please respond. Great. And Reverend Leslie, from a, a faith perspective and a faith message, how would you supplement that um, to add that, that, that critical faith message to in, instill um, hope and um, courage to respond? Well, I think it, you know, the census is a way of looking at being hopeful just in general. It's a tool for us knowing who is here, how many people are here. It's a way of being able to allocate resources that are very critical. Um, I believe it's also a matter of justice um, in our communities. And I would say coming from a, a African-American context, um, I would say for people who are what we would call black and brown immigrant communities um, that are often, as has been mentioned, undercounted, um, it is important to participate in the census to be counted and for everybody to be counted. Um, and when we're not, it costs us, right? It costs in education, it costs in representation, it costs in hospitals, allocations for hospitals, it costs in resources that goes to towns and cities across the country and it impacts how they're able to provide, um, municipalities are able to provide for their citizens. Um, and it costs really in issues of justice. So I think the hope is that we have a moment and an opportunity uh, to change that trajectory and to change um, the ways that people have been undercounted by really emphasizing and encouraging people to make sure that we're counted. Because the sad reality is, especially for um, people of color, I would say, for people who are poor or live in impoverished conditions, being counted by filling out the census is free, but not being counted is very costly. That's a powerful message. Thanks for that. Um, so we've all had to adjust because of COVID-19. Many of us had in-person events planned. We had um, tactics that you know would now put us at risk of the virus if we continued. So I'm curious to hear from um, Hernessa, how have your tactics of your organization changed because of COVID-19? How have you had to adjust? And what do you encourage other people to do as well? Okay, so I think with all faith organizations, we've all moved um, into being in the virtual world and doing a lot of our sermons and classes online. And I think that is a, a great tool that we've been given um, in times like these where in a pandemic, you're forced to stay home and kind of uh, be distant from everybody else and making sure that everyone's being kept safe, yourself and everybody else um, living around you um, as well. And one of the things that I encourage communities to do is use that platform. Um, Zoom has become a, a in, integral part of, I think, every a household, and that uh, I hope it does not crash. <laughs> um, but think about it. When we use Zoom, we give out messages. We talk about many different things from faith communities. Our imams are giving lectures and keeping people hopeful and talking about what God wants us to do and how to connect with him during this time that we're home. But at the same time, it's a platform for us to use to advocate for the senses and let our people know that as Muslims or Christians or people of the Jewish faith or any other faith that it's in, you know, imperative for us to take that 10 minutes and actually fill that out. And when these messages are coming from faith leaders like we have today on this panel, it, it's more receptive for the community that's actually listening to it. If it's coming from someone who's leading the congregation, who has many members, people, when they hear that message, they're more accepting of the message. And that's what we have to do. We have to use the platforms that we have now in order to encourage people people to go and go online and fill it out. So going online, filling it out is 10 minutes. And when you fill out all the questions, no one's going to come to your house, get it done first, get it done, right. Fill out all the questions. It only takes 10 minutes. And then you won't have to risk anyone coming to your house, putting you and your family in danger or putting that um, census person in danger as well. So, you know, it's not that complicated. It's very easy. If you know, you need help. I think community
communities are very um, uh, able to have people from their congregation helping people fill out that form. And that's one of the things we were planning on doing at Adams is to have people um, present at Friday prayers and helping people fill out their forms, filling out their senses um, via online. We would have had laptops and tablets ready for people to come who haven't done it and people would be helping them filling them out. Even those people who do not speak English and would not be able to fill it out uh, online, we would have people there who would speak their language and who could help them translate and help them fill out the form. So we had all these resources, but now because we're stuck at home, we're kind of figuring out other ways to do that. But either way, we're still here to help our communities in filling out um, their senses. Absolutely, and I know, you know, this is all so new. This is new territory for everybody. So many of us are still um, trying to figure out the, the situation and how to best do outreach. Um, so thank you for sharing, setting that the stage for us. Adan, what are some tactics that Naleo is employing among your field staff and volunteers um, and the people that you've trained? How are you working to get out the count during this time? Right. Thank you, Kelsey. I think just like everybody, we are making real time shifts in the in the moment. Right. And just like everybody, we've had to pivot all of our work into the digital space. Right. Many of our regional colleagues across the country were working hard to have trainings where they would provide all kinds of technical assistance to really create and reinforce census ambassadors in their communities. And we know that instead of having those trainings at schools, churches, at community centers. Instead, all of these trainings have gone completely digital, right? In fact, we have another training this later this week, actually tomorrow. So if folks are interested, I'd love to share more information about it, right? So for one, you know, all of our work has gone completely digital. You know, we know that many of our field staff were also working to have all kinds of different events right, all kinds of promotional activities this week that they were going to conduct in field in person. Instead, they've gone ahead and transitioned those into Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, right? Our colleagues are having all kinds of Twitter chats, right, to elevate the importance of census participation. Our other colleagues are also having Instagram lives where they are answering all kinds of census questions and providing our community with that technical assistance, right? So we know that we are definitely trying to do our very best to leverage the power of social media as we continue to really tap into all of our Spanish media partners, right? We know that even if folks are having to stay home, right, if folks cannot go outside, we know that they are still watching TV. We know that st they still are listening to the radio, right? And because of the corporate citizenship of partners like Univision and Telemundo, we are able to get the word out there about census, about the importance of participating, right? In through a trusted source that many Latinos really look up to and many Latinos really consider as, you know, that platform for critical information, right? So we've made a bunch of these shifts. We have also continuously made an additional investment into Facebook, Twitter, Instagram on all kinds of ads. And we are always thinking through different ways to get even more creative, right? To make sure that our community can get this information, this education and our community response. That's excellent. And um, Faith in Public Life has um, resources that we will be sure to put in the chat. Um, about how to get out the count in your congregations as well. We have sample announcements that you could copy and paste into an e-newsletter. We know that people are doing Facebook Lives for um, worship and for gatherings. So we have preaching guides, sermon guides, prayers that could be read. Um, so we encourage you to uh, check out those resources um, and see how you can integrate. So we're just really encouraging people wherever you Whatever you're doing now, integrate the census, whether it's remote worship, you still have newsletters going out. You're still um, you know, checking in with people in your congregation over the phone. Have you asked people, have you taken your census? We can go both you know, new age with the technology and old school with phone banking and just checking in on our neighbors. Um, that's what, those are kind of the, the tactics that, that we're using. Thank you so much for sharing um, that. And so, um, Curious, Adan, if you could also just to walk us through, this is the first census online. Uh, that's just one way of responding. This census is about right. choice. what are the choices people have and how can people respond? Of course, so there is three different ways that people can respond. I think that the really cool thing about this being a census in which 
response is pushed primarily through that digital response, right, is that the online form is available in one of 12 non-English languages, right? So if you have community members who might want to answer the form and say, for example, Spanish and any of these non-English languages, right, they can go ahead and do so by the click of a button, right? So folks can actually go online starting now if they haven't already. In fact, more than 30% of households as of yesterday have responded, and we definitely need to continue doing our part to push some of those numbers up, right? And so here's the thing, because it is online and because the census is an enumeration of households, every household will get a unique ID, right? As of two weeks ago, most households across the country who were going to be invited to participate, right, were, should have already gotten that code. We know that sometimes you may lose things. I don't know about you all, but sometimes I put things in my bag and it just goes into a black hole, a black hole right? And what's, what the really cool thing is that you don't necessarily need a code, right? For, for, so for whatever reason, if folks lost this code, they didn't get this code, they can still very much go online. They can go on 2020census.gov and respond then and there, right? In addition to that, so folks can also pick up the phone and call and get the assistance of a Census Bureau staffer. And the Census Bureau staffer can walk in through the enumeration process so that folks and everybody in their household are counted, right? Just like there is assistance in 12 non-English languages on the online option, there is also phone assistance available in these 12 non-English languages via the phone, right? So if folks are looking to get help in English, Spanish, and Russian, Arabic, Tagalog, they could get assistance in those through those hotlines, right? And I'm happy to share the information about these assistance numbers in the chat box just to make sure everybody gets them. Finally, like I said, you know, we also understand that there is a lot of fear when it comes to participating because this is mostly an online census. Many people across the country are concerned that the census questionnaire and the census website might be might be vulnerable to cybersecurity attacks. Many people don't want to share their information online. That is completely okay. Starting next week, people will start to receive a paper form. You should be getting those in the mail starting April 8th. If that is your preferred method of responding, you can go ahead and fill it out, send it back in and consider yourself counted, right? So it is fast, quick and easy and all of your information is safe by Title 13, right? So don't be afraid. You know, this is everybody's civic duty to participate in this. It takes a couple of minutes and with that, we can shape the future of all of our communities for the next decade. Great. A, a nice message I heard, um, 10 minutes, 10 years. Takes 10 minutes to fill out the census, impacts the next 10 years. So go ahead and tweet that with the hashtag faithful census and hashtag census day 2020. Um, great. So it, I would just want to open it up to anybody of our panelists. If you'd like to share some of the tactics that you're using with your organization, encouraging other people to use um, to help get out the count um, during this, this time and moving forward. Yeah, Kelsey, thank you for this. Um, I think what, what's important for us to remember also is people who fall in the digital divide, people who, who don't have Zoom, uh, people don't, who don't have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook Live. I want to say that we at the National Latino Evangelical Coalition in, in collaboration with Faith and Public Life, Naleo, and so many others on this call, and the U.S. Census Bureau, we've made sure that the platforms reach as many types of people uh, across the digital divide. And so we have a phone e-bike or a phone bike that is able to do it. We have Twilio that sends people's text directly to their message. And then good old fashioned radio. Uh, we have a radio program that every day we, we uh, in a portion of that radio program, in addition to message of hopes during COVID-19, we talk about the census in Spanish. So Spanish language, Christian radio, Spanish language, television, uh, and we're telling people to, to, to fill out the census. So we want to uh, be mindful of those people who have historically are not on the digital platforms or the virtual platforms, that there are other ways to reach them, even amidst uh, COVID-19 where you can't go to their home, you can reach them through radio, you can reach them through text, you can teach them through, through phone by. Eh, queremos decirle también, en particular, Puerto Rico, 
Puerto Rico eres parte del censo. Puerto Rico is part of the census. And some people think, what about, yes, so we have a few people from Puerto Rico connected, yes. And after Hurricane Maria and the recent earthquakes, they may say, well, where do I go? Well, they can fill it on online. And as Adan and others have said, um, <clears throat> you can uh, go and there's Spanish language, Creole, Arabic, uh, a whole host of languages. Así que, eh, eh, y si llegaste los otros días y estás viviendo aquí varios meses de Venezuela, de Puerto Rico, de Cuba, de cualquier país de América Latina, eh, debes llenar el censo. And so the National Latino Evangelical Coalition and a whole host of other Spanish uh, faith groups are telling people, please, especially the elderly uh, who may not be uh, on, um, not uniquely them, but may not be on some of these digital platforms. In addition to our Facebook Lives, our Zoom rooms, our our Twitters, our Instagram television, uh, so forth, our TikTok for the kids, for the young people. All, all of that is important. But let's remember, as you say, what some young people call old school, what I'll call classic methodologies of engagement and in the language that people say, like Adan has said, uh, programs like Univision and Christian radio and Christian uh, television. Pastor, leader, religious leader, when you're on your digital platform, you can take 30 seconds and talk about uh, you know, census.gov, you can talk about the hashtag, you can talk and, and point them to the resources. Eh, así que déjese contar, como dijo Kelsey, eh, 10 minutos, 10 años. 10 minutos, 10 años. What you do in 10 minutes will face your, 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 your congressional representation, your financial resources for the next 10 years. So, and especially I also want to talk about those people who are, are in hard to reach places, uh, they may be in First Nations, uh, reservations, in other places. We want to tell you that all of you count. So thanks. Amen. We have some questions about um, people who are experiencing homelessness. It goes into that conversation, people who are not on um, maybe social media in the same way. So can we speak about the group quartering and the um, both of them actually, the group quartering with college students, uh, mm -hmm. those changes, and also people experiencing homelessness, um, how are they counted? Of course, I'll go ahead and tackle the college student piece first, right? Like I mentioned earlier, we know that there is a lot of confusion around COVID-19. And part of that confusion is because many universities, college campuses, dormitories have had to shut down for the well-being and safety of their students, right? Which means that many students have had to move, go back to their parents' address, go back to some other location. It's important to remember that for these students, right? that they are still counted through the group quarter response if they were living on a college dorm. <clears throat> what I mean by that, so the Census Bureau was going to have a, is going to have and has a specific operation in which to count people who live in group quarter facilities. These are hospitals, nursing homes, detention centers, dormitories at university campuses, right? And part of those changes around COVID have meant that these operations have one, put on pause, right, in many different instances. And two, what it also means is that in some cases at these group quarters, the Bureau was going to drop off questionnaires, pick them up. Sometimes the Bureau was going to conduct in-person interviews. Instead, now to avoid that in-person contact, the Bureau is having conversations with these group quarters to, to instead, right, have them send their information electronically so that everybody is counted without having that in-person contact. What this means for college students is that, you know, your university, your dormitory, right, still has information about you and they're still going to send that information right to the Census Bureau so that that student is counted. Say, for example, that college student was living off campus, right, was already commuting, you know, from some kind of other address, then they would still get counted at their typical either off-campus address or that commuting address. The, the student, at the end of the day, it's important to remember that they need to be counted where they sleep and live most of the time, right? And they need to be counted where they were going to be at on April 1st if it wasn't because of COVID, right? Second, when it comes to counting people who are experiencing homelessness. So the Bureau has a specific operation to count people who are at shelters, at food vans, at encampments, you know, under freeway overpasses. And that operation was actually going to take place this week. Earlier, I mentioned that the Bureau was going to put some of these operations on pause. This has meant that the Bureau 
as opposed to conducting the count of people experiencing homelessness this week. Instead, it has pushed it a month back and it will happen towards the end of April, right? We are still waiting to hear what's going to happen around continuous changes and adjustments from the Bureau. Like I told you, they're monitoring the situation and adjusting in real time. But the idea is that the Bureau is going to count all of these people at food vans, at shelters, at mobile encampments, right, at the end of the month. If somebody thinks that they didn't get counted or for whatever reason the Bureau might have missed it, I mentioned earlier that one of the cool things about this being a mostly digital census is that you do not need a unique code, right? So at any point, anybody who has access to a phone, tablet, computer, or wants to provide that access can jump on a computer and be able to respond, which is another very helpful tip for folks who are experiencing homelessness and may not have, for example, an address, right? They can just share in about 200 different characters where they live, reside at most of the time, and that is more than enough for the Bureau. So yes, you know, homeless folks are still counted. They can go online. The Bureau is making adjustments, but they will have an operation for counting people who are experiencing homelessness. And two, College students are still counted. If they were living at a dorm, they're gonna be counted there. If they have moved, they need to be counted at their address if they wouldn't have moved as a result of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, so many changes, so important for us to know what those are and to share with our communities. Um, our time together on Census Day 2020 is coming to a close. Um, I wanted to uh, wrap up with a simple question, um, but you know we are in the midst of this crisis and it's become evident here. We know that the census really are the, the building blocks for a better tomorrow, a better tomorrow for our children's schools, our hospitals, uh, the programs that uh, people of faith have been fighting for and advocating for for so long. Um, and so I thank you all for participating in this important conversation and to each of our speakers for your incredible faith uh, wisdom and the information that you've shared. Uh, so to wrap up in a lightning round, I'm going to ask each of you to uh, use one word. What is one word that you would use to describe the census? Whether that is a, a logistics word, a word of hope, um, a faith word. Um, Adan, what is one word you would use to describe the census? Empowerment, just because it's our community's opportunity to say we are here and we will be counted here. Amen. Sister Simone. Uh, I think it's an electrocardiogram of our nation. It measures our heartbeat and how well it, we're doing as a nation. We need to know everybody. Yes, and that is Sister Simone Campbell of Network Lobby. Um, Reverend Salguero of um, National Latino Evangelical Coalition, what is your one word? Aslo, aslo, aslo. It's the Spanish word. It's one word in Spanish, two words in English. Do it. Do it, do it, because it's important. That, that counts. And um, Reverend Dr. Leslie copeland Toon of National Council of Churches USA, your one word. Just one word. I would say justice. It's a way to do justice. Thank you. And um, Hiranessa Fariad the, um, from the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, otherwise known as Adam Center, what is your word? I would use the word humanity, and I think it's it's proper to use this because it encompasses everyone and that everyone counts. Amen. And we also do have um, Jesse Smith here with the United, um, the, the Methodist Church, and so thankful for you hosting this event. Um, Jesse, would you describe a word for the census? Uh, 10 years. Exactly. So we heard empowerment, justice, humanity, Oslo, many words. Um, I hope that you take those with you, share that information with your community, share this Facebook Live. It's too much important information for us to keep it to ourselves. Um, together, we can ensure a faithful census. We can't do it alone. It will take all of us. And so thank you to everybody for joining us here on this Census Day 2020 Facebook Live webinar conversation. And we wish you well, um, health and um, safety as we move forward together. Uh, with the census and the many other challenges we have beyond. So thank you, everybody, and blessings upon your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Don't forget to get counted. Thank Cuenta. you. Adios. Adios. Ciao. <laughs>